All right, all and sundry, welcome to the Natural Resources Fish and Game Lunch and Learn. It is November 6th. I'm Jason Moore. I'm the Legislative Environmental Analyst. Uh, today I am with Casey Pallister. Um, another, uh, we're both researchers in the Legislative Environmental Policy Office. Uh, the two of us and a few other staffers handle nearly all <coughs> bills uh, and policy issues related to natural resources. Um, um, not here today is Griffin Burns. He is our energy policy guy. He has one of these uh, webinars set up for November 22nd, uh, Energy 101. So, so the Environmental Policy Office, we do, uh, like I said, bill drafting and policy research related to uh, quite a few titles in the Montana Code, uh, Parks and Rec, Environmental Protection, Land Resources, State Lands, Minerals, Oil and Gas, Water Use, and Fish and Wildlife. So today, what uh, Casey and I will talk about are uh, bills from the last session related to natural resources and fish and game, um, interim studies and issues that have come up since that legislative session, and then an early look at what we're seeing for the next session. So let me get my screen up. Do you see, do you see that, Casey? Yeah, it looks good. Going to start at the beginning. Okay, here we go. So I've got a very truncated list of bills that passed during the last session. Um, just understand these issues may they may not reappear uh, in in twenty five, but I thought they're worth they're worth mentioning. Um, these are bills that uh, you know got a lot of discussion, have big ramifications or otherwise very noticed. So starting with House Bill 114, um, that is a bill to basically reduce the uh, permit timeline to get a new water right or to change a water right. Uh, I remember the department said in best circumstances, they could go from about a year to 105 days to process that. Um, uh, it's, as far as I know, everything's going uh, to plan and what we'll know more as we as we head down the road. House Bill 521 conservation licenses. Um, these are the, uh, those licenses that had in the past been charged mainly to uh, hunters and anglers to be on state lands. Um, and it's kind of been expanded to pull in floaters and I think I think bikers and hikers for for use of state lands and they're now called wildlife conservation licenses. So I'm you may have folks that uh, had to buy those for the first time this past summer. Senate Bill five, uh, one or Senate Bill fifty five, uh, the legislature joined the the state and the interstate mining compact commission. That group is, I think, about 24, 25 states that advocates for a regulatory program that conserves natural resources and secures a vibrant mineral economy. Um, from what I've seen since uh, Montana joined, uh, that group has kind of discussed some of the bigger overarching federal uh, uh, acts and laws. I mean, all, most of our natural resources laws uh, take their root in federal law. Uh, I do know there was a regional me meeting of the association uh, in Montana. SB 83 created the Western Montana Conservation Commission. This got rid of a couple other uh, uh, commissions, uh, reduced it in size. It's kind of a group that is put together to uh, consider really all natural resource issues west of the Continental Divide. Um, they are required to meet a couple times a year. They are required to have public hearings on the condition of natural resources. I do know they did get a major grant from the EPA, a toxics reduction grant. I think that's directed toward lead issues, uh, which will be coming bigger as cities have to identify all their lead service lines. Um, but I think they're just getting going on that. And then uh, Senate Bill 228 prohibit local governments from banning petroleum fuels. And this was aimed at uh, banning a, a city from uh, prohibiting new gas stoves, for example. 
there were concerns that it might go beyond that and and, and kind of take away a town's ability to to regulate you know a power plant or refinery um i'm not sure this has been tested uh, but it but it is on the books so after the session ended uh what has happened since 23 I'm going to talk about mostly what happened in the Environmental Quality Council and the Water Policy Interim Committee, uh, two of the main natural resource committees that meet in between sessions. And it's worth talking about the interim because in my mind, that gives us a, a preview of things you might hear about in this next session. And you'll notice many of these have to do with state, kind of the state federal relationship. So first up for the EQC was their study of the EPA Superfund process at the Smurfit Stone Mill site in Frenchtown. That's the former liner board and pulp mill there that, uh, you know, hazardous substances were used and produced. Um, it's got those large uh, wastewater holding ponds uh, right up against uh, the Clark Fork River. Um, it had been in production since 1957. The Owners went bankrupt in 2010, and right now it's one of 18 federal Superfund sites in Montana. And so the EPA, they're in charge of the cleanup, although with a lot of state involvement, they're right in between determining what the risks are, where the risks are, and how could it be cleaned up. They got to do that before they come up with a cleanup plan. In 10 years since this work, or more than 10 years that this work has gone on, there have been concerns from the community that there hasn't been enough sampling of the soils or the groundwater to know where those risks are or how big they are. There's big concern about those berms that surround the, the old uh, discharge ponds next to the river, especially if a big flood event comes through, will it discharge a bunch of you know, uh, um, dioxins into the, into the river? There was also discussion about these old uh, outfall pipes that were used to uh, discharge pollution into the riverbed those are still there, although they are not discharging anymore. <clears throat> and there has been a fish health consumption advisory for just upstream from the mill site, um, 148 miles downstream to the confluence of the Flathead River. So that's another community uh, concern. Now, of course, the council, the legislature can't tell the EPA what to do, but they did make recommendations and the EPA agreed to to some of them. Um, the agency agreed to drill 12 additional groundwater testing wells, and they agreed to test those wells four times a year to kind of capture the seasonality of runoff and groundwater movement instead of just twice a year. Another big uh, topic of discussion for the council was the idea of riverbed trespass, these outfall pipes, people want them removed. Um, the council discussed, could this be avoided in the future? Um, proving trespass, even though the state technically owns the riverbed, proving trespass is something that has to be determined in court. Perhaps there would be some legislation that way. Perhaps there would be further study of this. I'm not quite sure. Uh, MEPA, the Montana Environmental Policy Act, um, some of you may, may have been hearing about. This act actually predates the 1972 Constitution. It what, it's what created this office, the Environmental Policy Office. It does not set additional regulatory authority for land or resource use, but agencies are supposed to analyze state actions, those are defined, that have an impact on the human environment in Montana. So that's when you see you know, an environmental analysis on a permit project or an environmental impact statement. Legislature has amended the act you know, more than 70 times in the last five decades. Right now, everybody is in a holding pattern waiting for the Montana Supreme Court to consider a, an appeal of the Held decision. That's the, for lack of a better term, the kids climate case, which was decided in Helena District Court. In that case, specifically to MEPA, struck down a couple bills the last legislature passed that limited greenhouse gas and climate analysis. So we'll wait and see what comes out of that. Likely legislation to follow, I would imagine. Good neighbor authority another state federal relationship. This was created in the 2014 Farm Bill. It allows the state, it allows counties and tribes to do forest, rangeland, restoration work on federal lands. So forest service and BLM lands, including reducing hazardous fuels, uh, timber sales, um, reconstruction, um, treatment of insect and disease infested trees. The DNRC 
our state agency has embraced this program. They had 10 timber sales uh, in 2023. The proceeds they get from those, they plow back into the program to do uh, more work, uh, which includes restoration, improvement of habitat uh, and forests. This does bear tracking. Uh, I know DNRC is doing all it can to mitigate wildfire risk in the state. Uh, and this authority is tied up in the federal budget, which I think is just kind of been continued uh, through the next month. Office of Surface Mining. Again, state federal relationship. So over the past couple of years, the Office of Surface Mining um, Department of Interior has ruled that three Montana bills uh, related to coal remediation are unenforceable. Um, these were deemed less stringent than the Federal Service Mining Control and Reclamation Act. That's the kind of overarching law that we have to also comply with as a state. Um, if the state were to enforce the provisions of, the th of those three bills, um, we would risk running the coal uh, mining program in the state. I would also expe expect some, some, some bills to kind of, there's always efforts to tailor federal law, our, our law to, to meet the spirit of the federal law, but more specific to Montana. So you might see bills uh, in that direction. Um, rare earth elements and critical minerals. Um, the council um, issued a letter of support or asking the Department of Defense to continue work at the Berkeley pit to uh, help the um, 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 Montana resources experiment with pulling uh, rare earth elements or critical minerals, which are used in electric vehicles and special forces gear. They can get a pretty, it's a good source of zinc and a lot of other things that I really have never seen these elements before, but it could be a source uh, uh, of some elements that right now the U.S. has to go out of country to get those. Uh, moving on to the Water Policy Committee, some of the issues they dealt with. Uh, they had also had an assigned study. Uh, the HB 520 study was of private fish ponds. The Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks licenses about over 2,000 private fish ponds. There have been concerns over the years building about these, uh, the impact of ponds, uh, fish in the ponds aren't supposed to escape in the adjacent uh, stream or river. Um, the department uh, administers the program at a loss uh, because the, the permit fees are pretty low and their time is fairly high. There are challenges for people who own private ponds to find uh, um, certified hatcheries to, to stock their, their private pond, um, which leads sometimes to illegal imports and that can bring in pathogens that can, can and haven't quite, but have nearly um, affected uh, several waterways in Montana over the past few years. The committee did propose legislation and I'll talk about that in um, comprehensive Water Review, this is a stakeholder group that was put together by DNRC, but was a big topic of discussion in the Water Policy Committee. Also, I expect um, at least two pieces of legislation focus more on how the DNRC, how the Water Court, those of you who've had to deal with that, or even the district courts will finalize nearly a half a million water rights in the state. Um, we've got kind of a you know a bunch of processes moving at the same time and and it, and it and the the push is to get it finalized so people have that document that says they actually have that ironclad water right which is especially important as we potentially head into uh, future times of water scarcity another uh, uh, bill or effort uh, through the review is directed to planning uh, specific planning and growth, specifically the use of exempt wells, those that don't need a permit. So you will see bills on those. Um, narrative nutrient rules. Two sessions ago, the legislature repealed our water quality standards for nitrogen and phosphorus. A lot of this came um, because wastewater treatment plant operators were saying they could not meet those standards mandated by the federal government without tens of millions of dollars of upgrades. And they, they kind of saw it as a diminishing return. So legislators sought 
to have narrative nutrient standards. Uh, it's kind of, they, they still are numbers, but they're different standards, different things to measure rather than just your absolute nitrogen, absolute phosphorus uh, at the end of pipe. The uh, DEQ proposed what they call response variables. They could look at algal growth in the stream. They could look at dissolved oxygen levels, temperature, invertebrate counts to see if a discharger was violating those these water quality standards. That effort has, um, even though it started in uh, after the 21 session, it still hasn't produced rules. Uh, it's been paused by the agency. I wouldn't be surprised if there's legislation related to that, uh, to change that somehow. Water storage, certainly a topic of interest for the Water Policy Committee. Water does so much for Montana, drinking water, irrigation, habitat, flood control, um, you know, hundreds of dams, thousands of reservoirs owned by federal government, state, private companies, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of this infrastructure needs uh, heavy investment. I think anybody's been paying attention to the troubles on the St. Mary's project. Um, that's a that's a big project, and it's got it needs big fixes. Um, the legislature has traditionally, I mean, there is a there is a budget for, to to maintain state projects. Um, they also give out grants and loans for 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 smaller, you know, water users association or irrigation districts to plan or improve their their infrastructure. The legislature, there's been more push on encouraging perhaps natural storage where you slow the flow of water into a waterway, uh, the runoff into a waterway, um, um, focusing on rehabilitating structures before they fail or even expanding uh, structures by raising the height of the dam. Of course, it takes money uh, and probably some other legislative fixes to do. So um, just to quick glimpse at what you might see or, or, or what is already come in for the upcoming session, um, two committee bills of note, one from the Environmental Quality Council on a study of wildland firefighting. This would could be essentially an update on a, a large 2009 study by a special legislative committee um, that revamped how we fund our wildland firefighting efforts um, and, you know, the, at least as the study is built now, it, it, it would be that and a lot more. Um, the Water Policy Committee, there's that private fish pond bill to increase the fees, tighten regulations for commercial ponds, uh, increase documentation, and allow the department to make rules uh, to administer that program. We also get this time of the session bills from um, uh, state agencies. There's a couple bills from Department of Environmental Quality um, seeking to change, increase fees for underground storage tanks. Those are the gas storage tanks, gas stations, and then hard rock mining fees. So you'll see those. And then to move sage grouse management, which is a uh, oversight team housed in the governor's office to the uh, uh, DNRC. You know, we're early in the submitted bills. Uh, we'll, we'll be, I'm sure we'll get hundreds uh, the rest of this week and next week. Um, what I've seen so far, and I don't have specifics on any of these, uh, about 40 water bills, you know, ranging from, there's always interest in water rights, uh, aquatic invasive species, um, certainly interest in fire, firefighting, uh, whether it be fire district fees, that's the a protection fee that um, the landowners pay if their land is classified as forest lands, uh, creation of a regional fire authority, even uh, limiting liability for power companies who might have uh, a role in starting or continuing a wildfire. Also, a couple open cut bills, um, maybe in response to 2021 legislation, which was meant to loosen regulations on certain gravel pits, but it's uh, but the effects have maybe been beyond that. So that's what I see in natural resources coming up. I will, Casey, let you take over and get off that screen. Okay, let's see if I can get this. Can you hear me okay? And you can see everything okay. 
All right, good. Well, thanks. As Jason said, my name is Casey Pallister, and I work on uh, fish and game topics here, Environmental Policy Office, um, among other things. And I thought I would just take a look, similar to what Jason did at, at some of the bills that came out of last session. And I was on the Senate Fish and Game. Um, and I'll be staffing another Fish uh, Wildlife Committee. We do have two of those in this coming session. Um, so talk about a few bills and try to follow some themes that I saw and themes across uh, past sessions predated me. Um, and then some of the things we're looking at for this upcoming session as well. Um, one of the things that uh, came up quite a bit last session was this idea of around public access to land for recreation purposes um, and landowner roles in access as well. Um, so we heard, I, I have a couple of sample bills. These are by no means the only ones related to this topic, but ones that I think uh, were relatively significant um, during the session. Um, Senate Bill 58, was related to block management payments. It doubled the amount that landowners who participate in the block management program can get from $25,000 to $50,000. Uh, um, it's an attempt to try to grow that program, make it more appealing for landowners who are participating um, or seeking to participate. Um, and then another relevant bill, I think, related to uh, public access would be um, one that actually didn't come through the fish and game committees, um, but went through transportation committees, House Bill 486, which uh, increased fees for illegally gating public roads from uh, $10 to $100 per day. And so um, obviously there's a lot of individuals at this impact um, when you're talking about roads and transportation, but there were a number of folks in the hunting and fishing communities um, that were very interested in this bill. And again, it's related to this broader theme of accessing public lands, in this case through private property. Um, so I expect to see more of those um, bills coming up this next session. Um, the next bills I have on here, I, I put technology related, although they're not te technically um, you know, related in terms of their uh, subject matter, they do relate to tech. Um, we did have a Senate bill 84, which um, was really looking at um, drones or what were termed unmanned aircraft. And so I guess with these tech related items, you know, they're, they're trying to deal with new, new hunting technologies uh, in some cases that are changing interactions with wildlife and also how to use technology to improve hunter experience or the recreator experience. So a couple of different things going on there. Um, in this case of Senate Bill 84, um, drones or unmanned aircraft were added to a statute that included airplanes um, and had similar restrictions around you can't use them to harass wildlife um, like airplanes or manned aircraft. You can't spot animals and hunt them on the same day. 24 hours has to pass before you do that. So drones became part of that, um, part of that statute. Um, I threw an e-tags here too, um, which stands for electronic tags, new way of tagging um, harvested wildlife. Um, and there have been a number of issues with, you know, how to validate tags, internet access while you're in the field, um, problems with apps and things like that. Um, and so there's been um, both some work done at the department on you know, expanding e-tags and improving the technology, but also with a, with a bill like House Bill 162, it, it allowed e-tags for essentially all species that you needed a paper tag for. So you currently can still um, use paper licenses, but um, you can also use electronic tags. Um, and I think we do have another agency bill related to um, trying to make the use of e-tags easier and more efficient, basically. Um, I put online hunter ed in here too, because, um, well, there was a couple of bills about hunter's education this last session. And um, I think I think it was around COVID that um, online hunter education really became popular in Montana. 
um, as a standalone course for certification for individuals 18 and under. Um, but it is something that's pretty popular in other states as well. So Montana is by no means alone. Um, some of the bills that came up last session were related to um, either reviving in-person courses, um, essentially eradicating the online courses or requiring what are called field days in which a person completes an online hunter's education course and then has one day of in-person training and demonstration of skills with a certified instructor. Um, those bills actually did not pass in session, but the department, uh, FWP did on their own decide to include field days in addition to online courses as of, I believe, January 1st of this year. So that is now a, a, a requirement for anyone who needs to complete or wants to complete Hunter's Ed. Um, so um, another issue that um, led to a lot of bills, not uh, all of them passed, but I remember writing a lot of them was uh, related to non-resident um, hunting. And there were a lot of concerns in the session around um, an interest in non-resident hunting numbers as in numbers of people and then how many licenses are being issued to non-residents um, you know and the the concern was around hunting pressure and competition with residents for for game um, like i said there were a number of proposals um, and a couple of significant bills related to this subject passed one was hb 593, which requires a department to annually produce um, a report on non-resident license sales, and they completed their first report. So if you went to um, the Fish Wildlife uh, website um, under their licensing section, you can find that report. Um, and then there was Senate Bill 281, which limited the number of uh, deer B tags or antlerless deer tags that non-residents can get, though there's some controversy over whether that would actually decrease pressure. There was an informative um, uh, demonstration, uh, presentation, excuse me, by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks during last session on non-resident licenses um, and, uh, and reported non-resident hunting days to kind of help educate legislators on what kind of pressure there is, and also the number of licenses issued and how much revenue that accounts for with the department. Um, so that was pretty helpful for a lot of folks. But I do expect there to be more um, bills related to non-resident hunting. Um, I think one of the most significant bills, uh, fish and game bills last session was Senate Bill 295, significant just in terms of the amount of conversation it led to um, and, and what it can potentially do. And that's related to the management of grizzlies. Um, and I, I put after delisting here, but it's really involves prior to delisting um, from, from the Endangered Species Act and um, after. So the department is actively working on how to manage grizzlies should they be delisted. Um, and uh, this particular bill dealt with um, what to do, primarily what to do with grizzlies that are threatening or appear to threaten livestock. Um, so the conversations around that were, you know, grizzlies being seen attacking livestock, um, what can be done by a, a livestock owner as well as grizzlies that seem to be threatening livestock, what can be done. Um, there was talk, I remember in committee of lethal and non-lethal management around this subject. So it became a, a pretty complicated bill, but it did give the Fish and Wildlife Commission the authority to make rules around this subject um, even prior to the delisting. So grizzlies, I mean, whether, I haven't seen anything um, yet about grizzlies, but um, it's it's a pretty significant issue because uh, recently Fish, Wildlife, and Parks completed its final environmental impact study and its grizzly bear management plan 
for statewide management um, uh, while the bears are federally protected and, and management for after they're turned over to the state. Um, and a decision, I think, on whether they're going to be you know, maintained or have a, a altered endangered status by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is going to be made, I believe, in January of 2025. So how that impacts the session and any sort of legislation um, remains to be seen. Um, moving into... Well, continuing in the subject of large predators, um, wolves always figure large, and I expect to see um, bills related to wolves in this session, quite a few probably, but one that um, I'll look at a few agency bills here, but um, one that I think will generate quite a bit of conversation is um, agency bill to reclassify gray wolves as fur bearers. Um, and Animals are classified in different ways by the department, and um, they are statutory al statutorily allowed to do this um, with wolves who have been delisted in Montana since 2011, gray wolves. Um, so the department and commission can determine you know, that, it, that there are species not in need and then manage them as a game animal or fur bear. So the, the proposal here is to classify them as fur bears, Put them in line with um, usually animals that are are trapped muskrat beaver bobcat mink and those sorts of things and and manage them in similar ways and you know if you purchase a trapping license it would automatically include a, a wolf license with it that's not including non-residents and again this is just an early look at the agency bill not its final draft so I, I can't see for sure what that will look like but again it should uh, contribute to some conversation wolverines are another animal that were recently listed i guess it's been close to a year now but also causing controversy around whether they should be or not and how that will impact management um, in federal and state levels um, a couple other agency bills that i picked kind of trying to follow those earlier themes um, one is to eliminate uh, or not to allow shooting preserves on public lands, but make those exclusively on private lands. Um, so um, to the statute now basically says that contiguous land that may or may not, uh, or that, that won't impact public hunting can be shooting preserves. So it'd be eliminating that and making this exclusively private property. Um, and then more technology, the motion detecting cameras or game cameras, as they're sometimes called, there's an agency bill um, to basically require that same 24 hour waiting period. If you see an animal, there's still a photo or a video image in real time on your, your game camera then you have to wait a full calendar day before you can pursue it. So attempts to try to deal with ever expanding technology. Um, as Jason said, you know, we haven't really hit the, um, the full tidal wave of, of bills yet, but um, a few that I've received so far are pretty diverse. Um, there's one that's looking at um, possibly providing permits for poaching reporting. In other words, um, if an individual reports poaching or helps um, uh, provide information leading to a successful prosecution of a person involved in poaching um, instead of, or in addition to the potential of a um, financial reward, possibly a animal permit in that area where the poaching occurred. Um, Another bill deals with mandatory harvest reporting. So this would be probably for deer and elk, but potentially all species where you would have to report on a variety of things related to your hunting experience, um, which is now an optional thing, except for several select species that are required in statute to, uh, to be reported on different ways. 
Um, and then another bill is related to modifying archery equipment. Um, it's specifically asking it for the option of people when they're purchasing a license to donate money to purchase modified archery equipment for hunters with disabilities. So similar to some other programs that um, exist already, like Hunters for Hunger, where you have an option to donate. Um, so a, a wide variety so far, um, and we'll see what, what comes in the next few weeks. I think that's it. All right, good job, Casey. Um, in the absence of questions here, of course, please contact either of us um, at any time uh, for more information. And I guess thanks to Mark and Becca for being our live audience today. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks.